Amen. Amen. Guys, would you grab a Bible and make your way to the Gospel of Luke? Luke's Gospel. We are beginning tonight. This is our first study here. We've been working through the Bible on Wednesday nights, a chapter or or two at a time. And so we've been in the book of Psalms for three years. (laughs) Took us to make it through 150 Psalms. And so we're really excited to be kind of moving back into the New Testament. And we're going to spend some time there. And we've kind of called it a chapter study, but I also need to be very, very clear It's not always going to be a chapter at a time because, well, Luke is laid out a little bit differently. I don't know if you've read through the Gospel of Luke before. Um, There's 24 chapters, and that might sound like, well, you know, that's not that long, until you realize that for some reason, the way that it's been laid out, in the first chapter alone, there's 80 verses. So although there's only 24 chapters, Luke's Gospel is literally the longest of the four Gospels that we have. And so, yeah, we're going to be taking it not always a chapter at a time, sometimes, you know, half a chapter, or is this going to be in this first chapter, a third of a chapter, and yet I'm so excited to be doing so. Excited to be beginning this this evening as we join, join into that, and we are hoping that God would meet you in a way that both draws you to hear from Him tonight. But if He gives us time, begins us on a study that will do some work in our lives that we so desperately need, So let's ask him for that. Let's take a moment right now as we do and and as we approach his word. I'm going to lead, but I'm hoping that you would also be presenting yourself there. That if there's just a space that right now that that you just need to ask for help. I mean, I don't know what today looks like. I don't know if you're, you know, feeling physically well or if you're a little bit worn down. You just need to ask him for strength right now. Or just if you recognize, boy, it's, I've just, I've been very distant from God this day or this week. This is a moment right now to deal with that and say, God, let's, Let's fix that, because I want to, he would speak to you tonight. If that's all in the place, if your life would be there, so let's ask that he would bring us there. Let's take this next few moments and just ask that God, that he would bring you and I into a space that we could hear his voice and that we would be able just to know what he is saying to us tonight. So let's pray for that. Father, thank you so much that you are a God who is consistently working. There is no doubt. Your word is very, very clear. You are always present. And you are always God. You uphold and you work. And so as we step into this day, it's very, very clear that that you are a God who is faithful. And you are a God who is doing what you said you would do. And that work that you seek to do in the lives of people, it's a transforming work where you tell us that those things that you've begun in us in Christ, you're continuing to do. That you are continuing to do a work in our world of softening and drawing hearts to you. It's what you're doing today. God, here we are. Help us not to miss it. You know what we need to, to, to be there. You know what we need physically or emotionally or spiritually that would make us so we're receptive and would listen and you would speak and in the middle of just an evening where we gather together we'd hear you i can't do that that's not in my power lord i admit that very very wholeheartedly but i long for your power that you would make it known tonight and that you'd open up your word to us in an effective and a real way. God, we ask for that tonight as we just submit this time to you and ask for your work. Give us ears to hear you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the Gospel of Luke, we began this evening, and as we do so, undoubtedly, one of its intentions is that you would know. Well, yeah, that's actually what it says. Would you notice with me, just as we begin this study, just these first verses that run from verse 1 to 4 that actually is, in the Greek language, only one sentence. (laughs) It's kind of crazy, but just kind of hear this beginning introduction into the letter. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you, an orderly account, 
most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Yeah, a lot of words there, and we'll break it apart a little bit, but get this at the beginning. He's he's saying, I I want you to know. I mean, if you could get this, I mean, there's something that would just affirm to us the things that God has for us, and certainly that's what he wants to speak. It might be just helpful just to point out a few details. There's a lot of other things. Some of you have study Bibles and I have notes on there that'll give you just kind of bigger understanding of the Gospel of Luke. I just want to give you a couple quick things, which is beginning to let you know that the author, the human author, well, is Luke. Now, that is something that is almost universally understood, but it's also worth just mentioning. Luke doesn't tell us that. In fact, none of the Gospel writers do. None of the Gospel writers announce that they're the ones. They never like, you know, hey, and this is Matthew, this is Mark. It's, no, they just, in one sense, almost just willing to step back and say, I don't need to be known. It's not about me. I'm not here presenting my life. I'm presenting other things. So they never self-describe. They never self-author any of it. But yet, historically, we have, we have a pretty good understanding that Luke is the one that writes the Gospel of Luke, and that's why we call it Luke. Now, we know a little bit about Luke. He is, interestingly enough, in the best of our understanding, a Gentile. Now, if you have a good understanding of your Bible, that's pretty unique. Uh, All the disciples that followed Jesus, they were Jews, and, and, and the gospel really began there, where it began in Jerusalem and then moves to the end of the world. But, but Luke is a Gentile. In fact, we know he's a physician. We know he's a missionary. Paul would describe him in Colossians when he writes it in Colossians 4. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. I mean, here's Paul writing this, and Luke seems to be traveling with him, and he just says, you know, he is, I mean, he just gives him this title. He is the beloved physician. I mean, he's a doctor. He's like, we, we, we love Luke. <laughs> I mean, we, I mean he's just, he, there's something about this man that is a blessing to those around him so that when Paul speaks about him, he's like, he's beloved. We really love this guy. He's a physician that takes care of us. Interesting enough, in Paul's very last letter, so near the end of his life in 2 Timothy, he would say it this way. He says, only Luke is with me. I mean, everybody else is gone. I mean, for whatever reason, everybody else is there, and he feels that a little bit. And all that just gives us this tiny bit of insight into this man that is a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, who who comes and ministers to him, even in his prison, where Paul is writing 2 Timothy, probably takes care of him and and, and blesses in the midst of it, and yet is used by God. And and so you'll see that. Luke writes the Gospel of Luke, and he also writes the book of Acts. And if you have ever get to the chance to kind of read through the book of Acts, you'll, you'll notice when it transitions, when Luke uses the plural and when he's using a kind of description about what's happening. Other times he'll talk about, hey, we were doing this and we did this. And you get to see him traveling with Paul in some amazing ways. Now, all that, again, just gives us a little bit of insight, but that specific passion in Colossians, Paul talks about those who are with him who are Jews, and he doesn't mention Luke, and all that, again, gives us a tiny bit of understanding that this man was a, was a Gentile who, who's seeking to communicate into this, and that's just a little bit exciting. I mean, just to give us some insight. By the way, though Luke only writes two books, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, number of verses-wise, he writes more of the New Testament than the Apostle Paul, unless Paul wrote Hebrews, which is another, if Paul wrote Hebrews, that kind of pushes him over, but that's another debate. But I just want you to understand, that's a lot. I mean, this man is incredibly influential in our lives and in the work of the church, which is exciting. But as he's doing this, he tells us right off the bat, he wasn't an eyewitness, that he wasn't one of the disciples that were with Jesus. He wasn't like Matthew, who writes the Gospel of Matthew. He, he wasn't there. He says, you know, as many have taken in hand there in verse 1 to set a narrative of those things and have written down and probably speaking of Matthew or Mark and maybe even some other writings that aren't scriptural. And he says, but just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers, you know, of the word deliver them to us, it seemed good to me, Luke says. Seemed good to me having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account. So, I mean, just gets fascinating thing that Luke says, you know, I, I wasn't there, but I've researched it extensively. 
I mean, I, I, I mean, he's probably spent time with, with all of them, I mean, Pete, with Paul and, and with Peter and with some, I mean, he's like, I wasn't there, but I, I have a, I have a, a perfect understanding. It's a, a term not of, of, of boasting, but of accuracy. In fact, it's an interesting term because it's almost a medical term. It, it's almost like the, the kind of a medical term where you'd say, I rightly can diagnose something. I, I have a good understanding of what this thing is. And so Luke says, I, I just felt compelled to write that. Now, all that is fascinating, but it's also just important for us to understand that although he writes it, he's, you know, empowered by the Spirit to write. That the Bible tells us that though God used human authors, it was ultimately the power of the Holy Spirit, which is, for me, all I really need to know. I mean, it's fascinating to me that God is using Luke, and I think that's fun. But I mean, it's, it's God was speaking through him, and so as we approach this book, that's what we want to hear. So, Human author aside, what are we going to read? I mean, what is the Gospel of Luke about? Well, it's a pretty simple thing, right? The theme, it's Jesus. And in fact, that's always the theme. I mean, the whole Bible is that. Jesus said, you search the Scriptures, and they are that which testify of me. That the spirit of the whole Bible ultimately is all about Jesus. But the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are the story of the good news. That's what gospel literally means. They're the story of Jesus, of his coming and his work. And so that makes it incredibly powerful. That very much so as we gaze into the gospel of Luke, what we're wanting to see is Jesus. Now, one of the interesting things is though we have four gospels and they are complementary, they're not either any, you know, kind of, you know, picturing a different Jesus, they all help us see Jesus differently. Luke is a gospel that in many ways has an intense focus on the humanity of Christ. That in many ways what we're going to see and the angle with which we're going to look at it is that. Now, hey, just as a quick aside, I don't know if this is going to make any sense to anybody, but it is a fascinating thing. We have four gospels, and they each kind of approach Jesus from a different angle. Matthew really helps us to see Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Mark shows Jesus as a servant. John shows the deity of Christ, and again, Luke, the humanity. Don't misunderstand that. That's not a way of saying that it's not evident in the other places. I mean, you can find the humanity of Christ in the Gospel of John, and you can find that he's the Messiah, and you can find, you know, so it's not like, you know, that it's showing a different Jesus, but somehow it's as if they each focus it on a way that helps us to see it. And it becomes this fascinating thing of almost this divine pattern of this fourfold pattern of, of almost seeing and, and seeing truth. And again, just, it's just a quick aside, but some of you just went through Ezekiel with us, and you might have you know, seen some of the, the crazy images that Ezekiel sees, and he sees these angels, and, and all, each time they have four faces. You know, they have these four angles with which they see things, and without spending more time in that, there is this interesting understanding that there is almost this fourfold, this, this different way, almost this four-dimensional if you want to think about it that way, perspective of all that God is, that is a fascinating way to see it. Well, again, that just kind of rabbited over there. Let's come back and just say, okay, well, if that's kind of an understanding that's helpful, then one of the things that should be at least a little bit in interesting or at least drawing is that in Luke's gospel, we want to see Jesus, but very clearly we want to see that Jesus was both fully God, but fully man. It's a question for you. Is that something you, you feel like as we move into this gospel that you need? That in some ways what, that, what you're, that what we require is that. I, I might be mistaken, but my gut tells me that for many Christians today, we are much more comfortable with the deity of Christ than with the humanity of Christ. That we're much more comfortable thinking about him being all-knowing and all-powerful, and just but then to see him as fully human to see him facing life in, in a way that would grip us there, that we'll see him deal specifically, it's going to talk a lot about how he prays, we'll see him, see him deal with women and children and the poor, and there's just going to be a lot of touch that just kind of speaks of this human part of life and this humanity, and I just want to tell you, I, I find it a needed place. I'm excited to begin this journey tonight because I feel like that in many ways that's what we're needing that we need to see Jesus. I mean, and maybe, I mean, sometimes what we, we need to see his humanity. 
and, and what that looks like. And so that's an invitation to you that if we move into this, as we move in this together, that God would meet you there. Okay, a couple more quick things. Luke is known as the synoptic. If you haven't heard that, that's the idea. Out of the four Gospels, three of them are known as synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason they are, that is because they basically travel at about the same speed. Uh, they cover, you know, the, the life of Christ in about the same places. John is a different one. He comes and almost fills in the gaps. Like, okay, you guys all talked about that. I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm going to fill in some of these things. And he covers some aspects that are totally outside of that. So in many ways, these, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they cover the same ground. Now, that's not to say that they're just repetitive. In fact, in Luke's gospel, almost a half of it is unique, that although it might be covering some of the same stories, it brings into us some things that we would not have known if Luke didn't bring it, and we wouldn't have known what was happening if Luke didn't kind of give us that understanding and help us to see that angle of Christ. And so he's inviting you and I to see that, and it's certainly where we want to go. So Luke's the author, the theme is Jesus, the audience. Well, it's an interesting one. Did you catch it? He actually said it. Tells us there as he's writing, there in verse 3, Luke says, It seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Yeah, he's writing this whole book, and he's writing it to a man that we know really nothing about. I mean, other than his name here, there's not any place else in Scripture that he's there. It's caused a lot of just debate and speculation. Some would say, well, perhaps that Theophilus was Luke's master. Most doctors in that culture were kind of slaves, to be honest. And so some would say, well, maybe he was this. And so he's kind of, you know, either released, you know, Luke, and, and Luke is responding to him. Or maybe it was just that Theophilus was his supporter. I mean, Luke really does seem to be a missionary, and so maybe Theophilus is a man that is financially and, you know, just making it possible for Luke to do the things that he's doing, and so now Luke is kind of reporting back to him and saying, I want you to know. I mean, boy, I want you to share this. I mean, there's just some fun, kind of like, I wonder how that happened. I mean, I wonder if Theophilus was instrumental in Luke getting saved, and I wonder, you know, if there's some kind of just connection that they have. It could be fun just to think about those things, but none of those things we know. In fact, it's interesting to think, well, it doesn't even actually have to be a specific individual. Again, we have the name Theophilus, and it's very, very possible. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, maybe it was somebody that Luke was communicating this to. But the fun thing is the Theophilus is actually a name that very specifically means lover of God. For you guys who have a little bit of understanding of the Greek language, Theo is God, and so wherever you see that is that. Phileo is the word of, of love or, or friendship love. And so it would have this idea, one who loves God, one who would, who would say, hey, that I'm one who is, is that. And it's entirely possible that that was what Luke was just saying. Hey, I'm writing this to you who love God. I'm writing it to, if you're someone who is a friend of God, who loves God, then this is for you. And I think I can say that. I, I hope that's true. I hope it's true of every person here this evening. It may not be true. I hope it's true of those who are connecting with us online. But again, I can't tell you that it's true, but I'm telling you it can be. That God is inviting you in to be a place of one who says, hey, I love God. And I, I love Him. And, and in that, it becomes a place where it's like, then this is to me. Then this is for me because that makes me the one that He's wanting to speak to. And to that person, to this person who loves God, again, He says what He's wanting to do. He says, I just want you to know. He says, I'm writing you these things, most excellent Theophilus, I mean, just this blessing, this honor that you may know. The certainty of those things which you were instructed. Like you already know some of these things. You've, you've already, you have, you have some bearing into them. You've been instructed in them. But I want to speak it into your life in a way that bolsters that. That certainty. I says, I want you to know the firmness of that. I want you to have this knowledge of this. Uh, the word that's used this is pretty powerful. It's epigenosis. Gnosis, you know, where we get the word knowledge even from, uh, you know, is that understanding of just knowledge. Epigenosis speaks of uh, this kind of just upon knowledge or this experiential knowledge. He says, I want you to know. I, I want you to take the things that you know, and I want them to go deep, and I want them to be firm. 
I want you to know the certainty of them. That's the aim and the intention. So we're beginning a study in the Gospel of Luke tonight, and I can tell you, because the Holy Spirit's authoring this right here, and I think it's an invitation. If you love God, if you love God, this is meant to take the knowledge that you have and fill it out, to make it stronger and firmer and deeper and more powerful so that what you can see would be a transformative thing. Now, I like that. And again, I just, I'm just asking right now that God would do that. I, I'm just asking as, as we begin the study on Luke that that would actually happen for some of you. That if God gives us time to make it through this gospel, that some of you would end it saying, that happened for me. That happened. I mean, I, I knew, but boy, it just, it, it just kind of grew in both depth and certainty and power. That's what God's telling us he wants to do. And so may he do it. Well, that's Luke's beginning. That's his introduction into this letter. We take that, we hear that, we want that, and from that we move into the very first story. The first account that is only given in Luke's gospel. None of the other gospels tell us of this, and it's the story of this couple, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Notice with me how it begins. Verse 5 says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias. Of the division of Abijah, his wife was the daughter of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. I just want you to almost just feel it for a moment. He says, in the days, you know, in, in the days of Herod, who's the king of Judah, there's this couple. We don't have time to, to go into the depth of background, but I just want to tell you, those were not great days. Herod is the king. But that's a bad thing. He's the king over Judah, but he's not even Jewish. Uh, We know historically he's an Idiomaean. He's actually a descendant of Esau. He's been put in power by Rome because Rome is kind of conquered. Israel's not in a good place at this moment. Judah's not in a great place. It is confusing. It is oppressive. Herod himself is kind of insane. Uh, he, he murders people just on a whim. He lives this very kind of chaotic lifestyle of, of not trusting anybody. Uh, the whole world in many ways is absolutely confusing. And it's in those days. <laughs> it's like it's in the days of Herod. He's the king of Judah, and it's a mess. I mean, it's a, it's a mess in many ways. And I just, I find that helpful, and we could spend time on it, but I'm just going to say a lot of similarities, a lot of things where we look at like our world feels messy. Our world feels confusing, and our world feels these things. But in those days, there's just this thing, that, that we have this one who, in those days, in the days of Herod, we have just, it tells out there's just this certain priest. There's just a certain priest and his wife. And I just want you to almost just feel the way that it's worded, because it's dramatic. You know, it's in those days of, the, of, of, of Herod, the king of Judah, there's just this man. There's just this certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah that, you know, had been put in by David and all the different priests who would be there. His wife was the daughters of Aaron. Her name's Elizabeth. There's a couple. It's kind of simple in its way, and its way is almost just you're kind of looking at the world and you're honing in on this moment, and here's this couple who are living their life in these days, and it lets us know a little bit about them. It says in verse 6, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and in an ordinance of the Lord, blameless. Here's this couple, and they are righteous. They are righteous before God. They are walking with God. They're trying to do what God says. They're living lives of seeking to obey His word in their lives. And I just need to tell you right now, that made them unique in their days. I wish I could tell you, boy, that was the the age that Jesus came into, but if you know the Gospels, that's not what you're going to find. You're going to find a very externally religious group of people. You're going to find people who, in the the time between the Old Testament and the New, have descended into a lot of craziness and, and things that are in the midst of that, that what we find in this couple isn't the norm for their days. They're kind of what we would say of a remnant. In their day, in their place, they're those who are seeking to live for God when others aren't. They're seeking to do the right thing. And 
God sees it because, again, this is the Scripture, and He tells us, you know, here they are. They're righteous before God. Like, God looks at them and says, they have a, they're right with Him. Like, they, that God have a right standing with Him. And they're walking. I mean, they're just seeking to live this thing out. Walking speaks of this idea of just progress, and, and they're trying to obey the ordinances or the words of the Scriptures. And they're just doing so blameless. Like, there's just not any place that you'd look at these people and go, well, you know, they really messed them up badly. No, that's not them. And that's kind of exciting. I mean, here's this couple that seems to be doing pretty well. They seem to be walking in all those ways. But, verse 6, 7, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. They find themselves in this place, and you just need to feel Again, just almost the drama of it. I mean, Luke is just a really good writer. He's like, here they are, man, they're before, they're righteous, they're walking. But Elizabeth was barren. But they have no son. And that day in that culture, that was a huge just mark that caused many to feel devalued and and struggling. Now, I just didn't touch on this just briefly because it, it's worth just making sure we understand it. We live in a different culture, but it's not entirely dissimilar. Think about it this way. Infertility is actually a really big deal. One in eight couples struggle with infertility. That's just huge. I mean, it's like, it's like it's greater than 10% of people. I mean, it's just a massive number of, of, of walking in the midst. It's one in eight struggle with that. And that's a place that really, even in our fellowship, even in the size of our fellowship, finds itself there. And if that's you, you understand. If you know somebody, you understand. I mean, it's one of those places that if you're trying and, 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 and that doesn't seem to be happening, it brings so much confusion. Like, why? Well, why do others? Why not me? You know, you know what, is God mad at me? You know, is something wrong? I mean, and, and that becomes this place where identity becomes a struggle, where, uh, you know, worth becomes an issue. And I just want to speak with compassion. That's not an unknown space. And you're not alone in that, and I hope you hear that. And I also hope you hear that it's not necessarily, you know, a, a place where God is in any way showing his disfavor. Because that's how some feel. Some feel like, well, if God loved me, if I had a right relationship with God, this would not be happening in my life. But it just told us, it just told us that they were right before God, walking. He's blameless. But they got this thing in their life that feels like it's a mark, but it's been there for a long time. They're old now. I mean, they're advanced in years, and you just have to think about this for a moment and feel it. As much as you can almost imagine what it was like for them to live, and I am certain for years, for decades, they probably prayed and asked, God, why not us? Why not now? What do we need to do? Is there something wrong? I mean, day after day, month after month, and, and there probably were times where they were angry, and there were times where they were confused, but it, nothing's happened. Now, the good news is they're still walking. I mean, somehow the, this thing that kind of just feels like a, a hard space has not moved them to rebel and move away from God. They're in their old years, and they're still walking with God. They're still blameless, and yet that's something powerful just even for us to step into. See, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm betting for some of you that's not your exact situation, but you can feel even right now its similarity. I know I'm speaking to some of you who you're walking with God. You're trying. I mean, you, right off the bat, you would know, hey, I'm not perfect, but that's why you know you need Jesus. But you're, you're, you're doing the best you can. You're walking with Him, and, and you're seeking to do the right things. And then there's something that is just, it feels out of sync. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's insomnia. Maybe it's, you know, not having a child. Or maybe it's not being married. Or maybe it's, it's something and you're like, well, I don't understand. I mean, God, if you loved me, why wouldn't this get better? Why is this wrong? It must certainly feel that way. And that confusion is not something that, that 
is abnormal. Again, I just know I'm speaking to someone like that. I, I know that feeling. I can imagine where they are, what it must have felt like to honestly be seeking to serve God at the same moment feel that, boy, there's this, this thing that feels entirely out of sync with that. So if you can feel that, well, that brings you into this day, that day where they are, because, you know, in the midst of this, this faithful, sorrowful couple who are kind of dealing with this, something incredible happens. It's a God moment. It's a divine moment where God just speaks into it, and so you just need to feel it again. It says in verse 8, so it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. A lot of details in that. I won't go into all of it, but it's Zacharias' turn. He's serving. He's a priest. This is what priests do. He gets to go into the temple. He gets to go in and burn incense, which was an incredible privilege, something that took place twice a day, according to Old Testament regulations. And so his turn came. Some would say it's the only time he would ever do it. Maybe it's something he had, or maybe it's something he'd done before. Somehow, though, it must have felt, it almost feels that way when you read it, like this was just a normal day. I mean, I mean he certainly didn't go into this day expecting his whole world to be changed. He woke up, it's his day to do it, He's going into the temple, he's going to you know, burn the incense, and he's going to walk out, and then, lo and behold, there's an angel. There's an angel. We know he's going to tell us later that it's Gabriel. Only two new angels are ever named in Scripture, Michael and Gabriel, both of them angels that are in God's presence. And he just, he's just there. I mean, I mean, totally unexpected, just standing right next to the altar. And Zechariah freaks out. I mean, that's what he tells us. He just says, you know, he saw him, and he was troubled. <laughs> Verse 12, and, and, and fear fell upon him. I mean, at that moment, I mean, he just turned white as a ghost. I mean, he's had no idea what this even means. I mean, certainly just scared him, had no grasp of what this was. And the angel speaks to him, said to him in verse 13, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Gabriel just tells him, hey, I don't want you to be afraid, which is just interesting. It's like almost the, the st- pat answer. Whenever you see an angel, that's what they need to say, you know, like, don't be afraid. I mean, if you have this picture of an angel, like a little cherub that's kind of like cute, you know, it's probably not going to work for you. It's like, oh, you wouldn't be like, oh, that's so cute. No, no. when you see an angel scripturally, it's tremendous. It's, it's terrifying. So it's always like, hey, don't be afraid. And he just tells him, he says, you know what, as you're there, as you're in this place where, where you're afraid and you're in this place that's happening, he just says, hey, your prayer is heard. Your prayer is heard, and there's going to be great joy and gladness. So quick, just hopefully you can kind of be piecing this together in your own brain so you could maybe answer this without me having to totally walk you through it. But so when did Zacharias pray this prayer? Obviously he did. Obviously they had prayed to have a child. When did they pray it? Was it something he was just praying about in the temple? I think not. I mean, you're going to read it in a moment, and he's like, he's like, oh, that's past. <laughs> like, that's, we're not even in that space of life. Like, we're old now. I mean, it's like, we're not, I mean, it doesn't seem biblically that this was probably the prayer that he had just prayed. It was probably a prayer that he had prayed a decade before, or two decades before, or three decades before, or four decades before. And, and, and Gabriel says, God heard your prayer. That's kind of a fun little thing just to think about for a moment because for years and maybe decades, maybe he felt like God didn't. 
Maybe they've been, God, why are we in this place? Why is this happening to us? Why can't we have a child? And, and maybe it was that moment where you just felt like the silence uh, is the only answer you're getting. And the, and the angel's like, we heard. God heard you. It just wasn't time. God had a plan for this. You had no idea what he was doing, but your prayer was heard. And your prayer was answered. And it just wasn't in your timing. And that's just this amazing, comforting thing. And, and this wild thing is he just tells them, hey, this is going to be this. And that's going to be something that's going to be great joy. There's going to be this gladness because of what's going to happen in your life. You're going to have a child. But it's not just any child. It's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And he packs it out in some fascinating ways that it would take, you know, whole evenings just to look at all the details in there. But places where we know that John, who's going to be their son, which we know as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, he has this incredible role to precede Christ, to be the one that would be the forerunner for Christ. And he quotes a couple of things, for example. He says he's going to go before him in verse 17, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And that's how the Old Testament ended. Yeah, the, the book of Malachi, it ends the whole Old Testament, everything that's there. God says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. He says, I'm going to send somebody who's going to make a difference, who's going to turn things. I mean, almost just the whole story of the Old Testament ends with this expectation of this one who would come. It's going to be their son. It's going to be the son they didn't even know they could ever have. It's going to be the one that comes to fulfill not only this, but other passages in Isaiah. One of the quotes that are here speaks of the one who's going to prepare the way of the Lord, making straight a uh, path in the desert, a highway for our God. That this is going to be the one that makes a, 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 a path before the coming of Christ. That his role is going to be this incredible space that is absolutely amazing. And he tells us so many great things. He's going to be filled with the Spirit from his, his womb. He's going to be a Nazarite from birth. Some incredible things that would just mark out John is altogether unique. But it's incredibly fun. So think it through for a moment. This is a divine moment. This is a God moment where everything is changing for Zacharias and Elizabeth. I mean, everything. Their life will never be the same again. And there are moments like that, defining moments in our lives. Days where God does something that you wake up in the morning and by the time you lay down, nothing will ever be the same. There are moments that God does that. Not always in our timetable. I mean, it certainly wasn't theirs. I mean, they probably prayed for this for years. But this is something they've longed for. And God says, I'm going to bless you and you're going to love it. There's going to be great joy. There's going to be great gladness. And indeed there was. It was going to be definitive for them. But it's definitive not just for them, but for the entire scheme of history. It's like I have, your, your life is a part of God's plan to save the whole world. Your life is going to be, what, what's going to happen through your son is going to fulfill part of the incredible work that's going to bring the Messiah into the world, and you have no idea what this is. I mean, it's just an incredible understanding, and there's just joy there. There's just something that's absolutely wonderful to almost anticipate what this is and what this could look like, and I, I want you to feel that. I almost want you to feel just how powerful that's moving. But if you know the story, well, the next part's not so much fun. Uh, yeah, well, this is a time where it's really a little bit faithless. Zechariah says in verse 18 to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man, <laughs> and my wife is well advanced in years. Ladies, you're like, that, be careful there, buddy. Um, you know, but he's like, you know, he's like, I, you know, we're old. Like, we're old. Like, I, I mean, how could I know this? And it becomes this question that isn't a question of, is it possible? It really is a question of doubt. Now, that's important. We'll talk about that more next week because Mary, who Gabriel's going to talk to in the next section, she's also going to say a similar kind of thing, but she's not going to get the kind of response that Zacharias is about to get. Zacharias's response is one where he doesn't believe, where he looks on this and says, how will I know? How, how could this even ever happen? How could this be a part of this? And, and his is not a mark of faith. And so the angel responds to him, the angel answered in verse 19 and said to him, I am Gabriel. 
who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not be able to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Yeah, he says, okay, you know what? You didn't believe. You didn't believe that this was really going to happen. And because of that, you're not going to be able to talk for the next nine months. You're going to have no voice. You're going to have no ability to speak the entire time that his wife is pregnant, the entire time in the midst of this, because you didn't believe. Hey, this is one of those heavy moments where you have to read this and think, okay, well, that's not so much fun. That, that's not a, that's not a, and yet there's something profound here. In fact, think about it just as a, a quick aside. There's reality in our lives as well. Paul would say it in 2 Corinthians, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. He says there is this place that because it, where we believe, that gives us a voice, that gives us something to say, that gives us a message. And there's a sense of saying, that's why he doesn't have a message. And he's not going to get to speak that message for nine months. That's, that's discipline. Yet God is lovingly, faithfully disciplining his child. In Hebrews, it would say it to us this way. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. I just need you to feel that that's exactly what's happening for Zacharias right now. This is one of those moments where it's like, it's a spanking. It's it's like, you should have believed. You, you, you should have believed me. I mean, this isn't just somebody idle. This is God speaking to you through an angel. You should have believed Zacharias. And so because of that, you're going to have this time of discipline. Now, don't get too discouraged because it's really going to go well for him. I mean, once John is born, he's going to have a voice and he's going to have this amazing prophecies. And, and they're, like, I mean, they're going to enjoy this to the max. I mean, when God said there's going to be great joy and rejoicing, it would be. But there is this discipline. We'll hold that for a moment. But then notice what he said in the midst of it. One of my favorite little nuggets in the midst of this. He says it there in verse 20. That behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which catch this, they will be fulfilled. They will be fulfilled on their own time. Somehow that just rolls across my heart in a good way. Because like I'm, I'm, I am going to accomplish what I said I'm going to do. Whether you believed it or not, it's still going to happen. I mean, your belief isn't changing the reality. It's just, you just miss the point of being able to believe it. And that's a discipline. Well, for, that's where John is. And so it plays out for him. He gets to leave the temple. And it says in verse 21, the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. I mean, you can just imagine like, it's taking them a long time in there. It doesn't usually take that long to burn the incense, and people are starting to freak out. You're like, okay, what's going on? When he came out, he could not speak, verse 22. And they perceived that he'd seen a vision, like they understood something dramatic happened. For he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of service were completed, he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days which he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So we have this place that I'm just going to use kind of just this idea of this favored exoneration, this place where God's favor shines. Where in the midst of this, Elizabeth just looks and she, she gets this, he, he comes home and I mean, it's a natural thing. This isn't a, you know, in the sense of, of, of like Mary's, you know, having this immaculate conception. That's not this. This is not the way that works where, where Jesus is con- just, you know, conceived without, uh, without any natural means. This is natural, although, again, they're old, and yet God had done it before with Abraham and Sarah. And it says his wife conceived, and she hides. I mean, she's like, oh, this, is, this is weird. Like, I just can't even believe I'm pregnant. So you can just imagine her hiding for five months. But then to hear her words, just... He says, thus the Lord has dealt with me. And the days that he looked on me, I mean, he saw me, and he looked on me to remove my reproach from among people. I mean, the Lord looks on me. That's what she's saying. The Lord sees me, sees what I am, and he's taking away my reproach. He's taking away the thing that felt that way. Now, I just want to make sure I say that again. Her not having a child, she'd felt that reproach for probably decades. 
She would felt embarrassed, and in this place where she felt that people looked down on her or considered maybe something wrong with her for, for decades, and now that's gone. I mean, God has looked upon them in incredible favor. It's a great story. It's just this great story. It's this great story in the Gospel of Luke. It's the way the Gospel of Luke begins. But I just want you to think about it for a moment as we kind of begin to tie this together and, and begin to close our evening. So why? Why does the Gospel of Luke begin this way? What is there about this that in some ways just should almost just give us a feel for where we're going? I mean, Luke's already said, hey, this is going to be there. This is going to be for you so you would know and feel the certainty of it. And so you have this story, have this story of this couple. And in some ways, I find it in the, this realm of gazing at the, the struggle in the world and the humanity of Christ, this amazing place. We find this faithful couple. And yet life has not gone well for them. I mean, it's not like everything's gone perfectly. They, they're, they're trying to do what God wants to do. They're trying to live this way, and, and, and yet they're, they're in this place, and yet God is going to intervene at exactly the right moment. He's going to do some incredible things in their lives that's just going to bring this into this incredible space. Now, if they handled everything rightly, it would have been great. We could have read it fun. But it's almost this great little beginning that's like, at the very beginning, Zechariah's like, I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, that's just crazy. I'm not sure I can even grasp that. And there's something that almost invites us to realize that in our weaknesses, in our failures, God is inviting us in to see these things, and these are going to be a part of it, part of a way where God's favor is going to shine on their life and reproach is going to be removed. For me, it just does something, and I'm not sure I'm communicating it the way I want to do it, but I want to speak hope to you. I don't know if I'm speaking to somebody specifically tonight in this room or online, and you feel like Zacharias and Elizabeth. I mean, you're trying. You've been trying to, to, to serve God for a long time, and yet something mars your life. Maybe it's cancer, maybe it's something physically, maybe it's like circumstances that don't seem to be working out, and you've asked God dozens, hundreds of times, and it doesn't feel like it's there. And sometimes you find yourself in this place, like, what's happening? And there's something about this story that just speaks to us like, hey, God is doing something, and the answer is really going to be found in Christ, and the reproach is going to be removed. If it's not in this life, it certainly will be in the next as we enter into eternity that there's this place where God's inviting us into this place where our lives could enter into this, and I, I just want to almost hold it out to you. I want to hold out Zacharias and Elizabeth. I mean, this crazy cool story that, again, only Luke tells us that he wants to begin his gospel with, that you and I could begin to see Christ through the lens of this couple and what they're facing and going through and John being born, and yet to feel somehow almost like, I want to know more about that. <laughs> I want to know more about this story. I mean, this is, this, this is touching life in its real place. And there's just life there. So I long that that would speak hope to somebody tonight. I long that for somebody you would hear and say, understand that God has heard your prayers. His timing is just not always our timing. And he is working. And, and, and your life being a part of both what he has for you and your life is a part of his big story those are amazing things. And yet, as we pull this to a close, I should also just say, if that's not where you are, this is a hope that is being spoken to those who love God, who are Theophilus, who are people who are there. And if that's not where you are tonight, then, then maybe even this story can tell you. I mean, God sees and He's inviting you into a place where He would walk with you and, and walk into life and bring hope into your life that could turn everything around. He is the God that removes the reproach. The reproach of sin, the reproach of shame, the reproach of all that life has brought into our lives. He is the God that can do that, but it's only found in His face. It's only found in His work. And if that's where you're outside of that tonight, then we just plead with you. Hey, come to Jesus. Come to a place where you're asking for Him to be your Savior, even tonight, that that would be a space that you would see, I do need this. I need this Savior. May God work that in us. So, Let's close tonight with our beginning in the Gospel of Luke. And again, if that's you that doesn't know Christ, we invite you to him. But if you do, I'm hoping, 
I'm hoping that you're one of those who are a Theophilus who loves God, and God is beginning to tell you, I want to tell you what you already know. I'm going to tell you the story that you already know, but I want to go deeper. I want to bring hope into your life. I want to speak into your life in a way that somehow just watching this couple, just this one couple, just and, and what they went through to become a part of this story, and just seeing them and thinking, I feel in some ways like them. May God bring you to hope and joy. And may he show you he's able to do in your life what nobody else could do. That those things which seem impossible to men, they're not impossible with God. He's a powerful God. Would you join me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, and we thank you for just this beginning study in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see what's here. I feel just the invitation that you're saying that this could be a space that our hearts would be encouraged, that those things that we know, they would become well-known, that they'd become deeper and wider and firmer. God, I thank you for the story, just the account of of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and there's depth there, there's emotion there, there's sorrow and pain and hope and joy, and it draws me. It just draws me to, to, to your work and say, God, I want to be a part of your work. Would you bring our lives there? For any that are outside of that right now, we pray that you draw them to you. And for those that are in, that they would hear from you and just the hope that's from you. May you meet us in that. We ask for it now. In Jesus' name.